Um, hi, everyone. And first of all, thank you for, for having me here. Um, this is an exciting uh, program, and it, it's really about kind of sharing um, our experiences and sharing kind of our approach to, to integrated design. Um, so I want to make this as engaging as possible within the kind of Zoom medium. Um, if everybody, if anybody has any questions, thoughts, uh, there's a few options we can go about. One, put it in the chat and we'll talk about it. I'll save enough time at the end to, to have some conversations. Um, there's a coffee chat where we can chat afterwards. Um, and if not, if you're not shy, just unmute yourself and say, hey, Seba, just stop. Let's talk about this because the intent is to make this uh, useful for everyone and kind of it's really a way of, of sharing kind of what I've learned um, about energy modeling and the tools themselves. So today's kind of next 45 minutes, we'll be talking about um, energy modeling and, and specifically um, I'd say energy modeling as a, a design tool. So before anything, my name is Sebastian Carrizo. I go by Seba for short. Uh, I'm a senior consultant uh, with Dialogues uh, Building Performance Team. If you don't know about Dialogue, um, we are a multidisciplinary integrated design practice. There's roughly 600 of us uh, with diverse experiences and, and backgrounds, and that includes architects, engineers, planners, sustainability consultants, building performance consultants. Um, we have projects globally and roughly five studios across North America. And before jumping into what I like to think it's the exciting world of energy modeling, I kind of wanted to share a bit of kind of my career path to get to where, uh, where I am. Um, I used to sit on the other side of these conversations and inside, um, maybe it was a big auditorium and, and always kind of, as somebody who, who doesn't, didn't really know what they wanted to do for their career as a long-term, um, I always sat and, and, and heard from all these great people uh, that had passions and careers that started very young. And I always get kind of stressed inside as to kind of not really knowing where I was going. Um, so, so I'm hoping that uh, that walking through kind of my path at least gives you a little bit of sense that it really doesn't have to be determined right now. And what you do now might be very different from what you do in, in five years. So I was born and raised in, in Argentina. And, and I'll start by saying that up until I was 14, my career goal was to become a professional soccer player. Um, that quickly came to a halt at that age. And then I kind of gravitated towards my second, um, I guess, set of, set of uh, interests, which were physics and, and numbers. So I did an undergrad uh, in industrial engineering. I worked a few years in what, what is called supply chain optimization and developing algorithms for sales forecasting. And then I came to Canada following the person who's now my, my wife and decided to do something fun and interesting and different and outside of my field. So I, I, I did a master's at Carleton in renewable energy. From there, it continued getting weird. Uh, I worked for a wholesale use clothing import and export company. Um, I worked in construction for a summer. Uh, I landed a job at a mechanical design firm in Toronto where I did a few years of kind of mechanical design. Um, I then moved to a specialty kind of consulting firm uh, doing energy models for five years. And finally, last year, I kind of landed at, at Dialogue in what is currently my, my role. So all this to say is it's okay to figure things out as you go along. There's no really right or wrong answer. And if you're ever interested in making a career move, within sustainability or modeling, um, go ahead. There's not really a lot, of, uh, a lot of formal training on what we do. And, and really, we really do thrive as an industry in, in having different perspectives and views. So some of the, 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 my colleagues and the people that I, that I consider the best modelers or the best energy consultants have backgrounds on, on music, architecture, math, business. So if you have figured things out, great, keep at it. If you haven't, just take it. Five, five years at a time, three years at a time, and see where, where things go. So into the world of energy modeling. And today's kind of agenda is really just three large topics. Um, one, we'll start with talking about kind of why we need energy models, why they're important for the sign and what they are. Um, and then I'll share seven kind of lessons learned in, in, in how to make energy models and energy simulation useful. And, and, and we'll leave some time at the end for, for questions. Um, I really was inspired in this presentation to share, what would I like, what would I love to hear when I was in that, in your shoes about energy modeling and how I can start shaping what I do in terms of, of making it more of a successful tool. 
this is not secret, and I think this group agrees, but human influence has, has really warmed up the rate at, a, at a, the climate at, a, at an unprecedented rate. We're expecting global surface temperatures to continue increasing. Uh, global warming of 1.5 and 2 degrees will be exceeded during the 21st uh, century unless we do deep reductions in our carbon dioxide uh, emissions um, uh, in the upcoming years. Um, and, and we are seeing signs that, that this is the, the, the effects that this is having in climate, it's having on, on the way we, we live and we build um, buildings. And we're heading in this direction and Canada recognizes it. And uh, at a federal, national and um, municipal level, um, we've set up clear targets from a climate change perspective on how we're going to mitigate the effects of, of climate change. Uh, we have 2030 targets, 2050 targets of, of net zero. And what we're seeing is the way that um, government or the way that, that, that we're moving towards this is through policy. And policy continues to evolve as a way of kind of hitting these this ambitious targets we've set up. In Ontario specifically, we know that the largest uh, source of emissions is through the built environment. Uh, and that includes both existing and new constructions. Um, as a result, policy and standards like the BC Step Code, like the Toronto Green Standard, have really been developed and continue to increase their requirements when it comes to new, new construction and making sure that we're able to hit the targets At a federal slash provincial level through the building codes, uh, we know that we, we've seen that the development of, of the new NECB 2020 energy standard uh, really is aimed at driving that design continuously to more efficient buildings with specific kind of tier uh, approaches. So we combine more stringent energy requirements, a better understanding of, of buildings and how they use energy. What we're starting to see is a shift between from what we used to use energy models for, which is this last kind of category called compliance, and basically checking boxes, um, to being an integral part of design. And just like as design evolves and design kind of continues to be a fluid conversation, so is energy model. So energy models take really different shapes and flavors as we go through different stages of, of design. So initial models are aimed at kind of addressing what I would call fundamental design parameters. So building envelope, orientation, massing, without really putting too much consideration on the mechanical systems, the electrical systems, because we're really trying to focus on those key elements that will define everything else. As models continue to develop and the design continues to progress, we shift our approach to using models to really informing on feedback on, on specific um, elements of the design and kind of continue building on that granularity and focusing on uh, looking at alternative systems, looking at specifics of the model all the way through compliance. And I would argue the most important part comes after the building is designed and built, which is how the building actually uses energy. And there's a lot of work that we keep, that, that we need to do in making sure that we're aligning the way we design a building to the way the building um, actually operates. So what is an energy model? Um, and, and the good thing about energy modeling is it's all online. So um, you don't need someone like me telling you what energy models are. You can always just do research and, and find it and, and the community when it comes to Resources online is great, but this is kind of how we look at models or how we at least show models to, to clients. Um, and reality is it, this looks very visually appealing, um, but it's not necessarily how I see models or how, how I interact with models. This is kind of how we show models to, to the outside. In its simplest form, and perhaps a more accurate representation of what a model is, is what you're seeing in front of you. Um, energy models are black boxes or calculation engines that take inputs from the design characteristics. So that would be building geometry, system characteristics, operation schedules, all the list of things you see here. They crunch up a calculation and the calculation is done on an hourly basis. So you break out your year into hourly bins and there's 8,760 bins. And then we evaluate how the building is responding um, to the way the building is, is, is operating, to the weather conditions it's experiencing, and come up with uh, outputs for performance comparison, for compliance reports, and that can take shapes on, on, on different metrics we're trying to address, so cost, greenhouse gas emissions, energy use. 
there are lots of energy modeling software uh, out there. And, and the two kind of axes here show both the level of detail you can get with these tools, but also the learning curve. Learning curve is important because as, as I said, there's not really a, a formal training on a lot of this. So it's, it's really using the tools and getting familiar with them. So understanding how complex the tools are will allow you to use the right tool for the right uh, question. Historically speaking, uh, tools like you see in the middle, eQuest, E4, CanQuest, uh, they're what's called Department of Energy, so DOE-based, and they used to be the norm for, for I'd say, the last um, 10 years. As funding from the different um, research uh, communities and government has had of migrated from these tools, they've started using, they're starting being used less and less because they have not been kept up with the changes in, in the building technologies. I'd say nowadays what we're seeing the most the most typically used tools in our industry are the ones you see on the top right quadrant. There'll be IES, Energy Plus in any of its kind of um, interfaces. That would be Open Studio, which is free, or the Site Builder, which has a um, has a, a, an annual fee. There's also a bucket of tools on the bottom left that are low learning curve, low level of detail. Um, which are really geared towards early stage feedback and modeling. And, and they're really, um, we see them a lot being deployed in, in architecture studios or um, as ways of kind of getting early, early understandings of how the, the typical massing will affect uh, the building. There's another one here called ESPR, which I've seen it more widely used in Europe and, and largely in, in academia. So lots of tools to use lots of different software to learn and it's really important just to to make sure we're using the right tool for the right job so brief understanding what energy models are kind of how they come to be why we need them but i want to focus more of our time today is on kind of th seven things i learned as i went through uh, through the, the, the process of the last nine years of working in this industry in terms of how do we take a tool like an energy model and turn it into something that's that's useful and meaningful and I'll start with the first one, uh, really being that energy is just one of the many metrics. Um, energy models have a tendency to produce very precise results focused on one metric. And we should not really be designing for energy as the end all be all um, metric. And it's really important as we approach high performance or integrated design that we account for all these metrics. Some of them will be easier to evaluate than others. So carbon is something that's relatively easy as a continuation of energy. Um, cost is something that, that we know plays a big role in how we design buildings, um, but there's all these other elements that are really important. Access to daylighting, aesthetics, with climate change, we see resiliency, flexibility, affordability when it comes to residential markets. So it's really important to understand that it is a balance between metrics and energy model modeling plays a role in providing one of the lenses but there's many lenses that we need to continue evaluating as we design buildings. And perhaps a good way of showing that is when we look at two metrics, energy use on the left, greenhouse gas emissions on the right, if we focus on making decisions only on one of these lenses, we really miss the opportunity to enhance the building as a whole. And in this case, if we look at the left, we might focus on um, targeting heating, for instance, targeting cooling as in this sample building as, as ways to, to reduce our energy. But if we start seeing things from an energy and from a carbon perspective, all of a sudden it becomes really obvious that what we really need to do is decarbonize this building and focus on the heating side because of the impact it has on, on greenhouse gas emissions. So the idea of, of, of having energy as one of the many lenses is important. It's important for all of us to continue pushing this idea of Let's look at it from, from different, different angles. Second thing that when I started, um, it was kind of different. We, when buildings got designed, they were kind of in a silo. You would have architects would design their piece. Um, mechanical engineers will design the, the, their silo and energy models will come at the end. Um, I think we need to shift our perspective and shift our, our, our approach because building performance uh, needs to be discussed um, early in a collaborative fashion and as a holistic multi-metric approach because energy fundamentally is a design problem. And, and the, the way we design has to include consideration to, to energy. Um, anyone or everyone should be fluent 
in energy talk because that way we have a common ground and a common language to, to speak. Um, and just like design is iterative and evolves, so is energy analysis. Um, it's funny to look back at really old buildings and see how the progression of the sign has taken us, perhaps devolved in a way from energy performing buildings or high energy performing buildings, which were kind of how we designed originally to glass boxes and, and kind of not, not really fully holistically thought out um, high performing buildings. And, and the message here is really building technologies that allowed us to build anything like we can build glass towers in Edmonton, in Nunavut, in Hawaii, with the same design, but that doesn't mean it's the correct thing to do. And I think when we understand that energy is part of the sign, is part of, a, of the design considerations, then we start making decisions based on climate use and, and building technologies. When we talk about kind of energy modeling in the context of, of part of the design, we really need to focus on making uh, energy analysis, outputs and reports accessible. Um, one of the, the, the biggest lessons learned over the last six years, at least or six years to me, because the first three were focused on the technical side, were really that, that storytelling is really important. And the way we frame a discussion and we frame an analysis really leads the project to a successful um, um, output. And we have to remember, not everyone sees models on a daily basis. Not everybody is fully integrated into how a model gets developed, and that's fine, they shouldn't. But the way we present um, solutions, the way we present analysis, needs to be in the form of the story. Um, and oftentimes we forget that really all that people will see from the energy analysis is really the deliverables. Um, when I look back at the last model I did, or the last few models that I did, you, you, have, you, you start seeing that you spend 80% of your time doing, energy, doing the energy model and only 20% of the deliverable. And unfortunately, the deliverable is really the only part that we get to communicate and where we really see um, action items. So turning, turning energy analysis into a story is, a, is the best way of getting, um, of getting buy-in and, buy and, and building better buildings. Um, and what that means, and it changes, like depending on the topic we're talking about, but always looking to kind of produce more visually appealing elements I work in an architecture firm, so this is a big driver for us and being able to um, turn things into things that look nice from an aesthetic perspective, but also that are easier to understand. If I give you the table on the left that just describes systems and I give you the flow chart on the right, um, I would expect more people to understand what's happening on the right side. Um, so being able to be accessible in what we do and how we communicate it um, will, will mean that energy modeling becomes more um, more and more accessible to everyone. And the same thing on the, on the result side. Most of the reports that I see have a table template on the left that kind of outlines a specific energy use, but it doesn't really tell us much or it doesn't give us enough information for, for someone who doesn't know about energy models to really see it and understand what the challenges are for that building. So when we move to more graphical um, outputs that kind of look at the energy performance as a visual element, all of a sudden we can start having everyone um, be more engaged in that conversation and really understand what's driving the energy use of, of a building. This one perhaps will have some, let's say, controversial um, statements, but um, I stand by them. So I'll walk you through kind of what, what I mean by all these things. But really, the, the, the way that I approach or the way we approach models uh, is, is to think about them as kind of like digital sandboxes in a way. Um, they allow us to play with our building before it's built um, and really experiment with different building characteristics in a quick and easy fashion and exploring the impacts on building performance. Uh, using kind of energy models, we can kind of identify the best opportunities for a project based on its specific requirements um, and just trying and experimenting make design better. Um, even if the answer we get to might be the same that we started, going through that process teaches us and, and lets us kind of get a better feel for the building. Um, but it's important to know that, that energy models are, are really tools. They're not design solutions. They're not intended to provide the specific um, design considerations that, that will 
be baked into the building. That's why we have architects, that's why we have mechanical designers. Energy models just provide us with targets and with objectives to drive for. Um, this idea that they're always wrong, but sometimes are useful, it's, it's kind of trying to, to, to put into perspective that, that we are building things that are predicting the future. And they're predicting the way a building is expected to operate, the way it's expected to be used, and the climate that it's expected to, um, to, to kind of experience. And if yesterday's downpour in my house showed me something was that we can't really predict that. And, and as such, we have to always keep in mind that the results we're getting are going to be very precise, but also going to be somewhat not as accurate as the precision that it gives us. And we always have to make sure that, that we keep that in mind. Um, the other, the other interesting things is just like with any tool, um, the results are only as good as the inputs. And we have to make sure that we, we put the right information and we, we leverage the knowledge of the design team into kind of making sure that the design inputs we put are representative of the building, that the climate conditions are representative of location because garbage in, garbage out. And that's, that's just general for, for any tool um, like, like energy models. Um, because they're kind of somewhat inaccurate, they're really best suited for comparison, early comparison of different design considerations with understanding that the results, although precise, will be somewhat less accurate. And we're really looking for comparisons between one alternative um, and another. Um, I like to call ourselves not energy modelers, but energy consultants. And I'm hoping that in two or three years, we'll not be called energy consultants, or we'll be design consultants or energy designers. Um, because really we, as, as someone who looks at models all day, there's a tendency to grab any problem. My kid is crying, let's put a model to it. Um, and not every question needs an energy model um, and not every specific um, require or not every model comes from, from the right question. I think before jumping into a tool, before jumping into the specifics of how we build a model, we need to take a step back and see and, and think critically what we're trying to answer. Um, there's also some random questions that I got in our last few weeks on, on, on projects that I've worked on. Um, but when a client or, or the science team approaches you with a question like, what energy target should I be setting for this building? In this case, it happens to be a healthcare building. Not jumping into a model gives us a better way of actually answering the question. I'm really focusing on what are they trying to get to. So benchmarking is a great way of, of kind of setting early stage um, targets. In this case, um, Ontario has a readily available energy use for all public sector buildings. So you can export, in this case, all the hospital facilities in Ontario, order them based on energy use, find in orange the median, find a few key examples that say, hey, Humber Hospital is a great performing building. This is what they're hitting. Toronto University Health Network, so the Toronto Western Hospital, this is where they are as a baseline. Where do you wanna be? And when we start the conversation from understanding the, the drivers of this question, we're really better positioned to, to really make meaningful impacts on, on design. There's another question that I get, that we get often, and. In May, the new version of TGS uh, kind of come, came into play. And one of the questions we have is, what do I need to do additional to what I'm doing now in terms of getting my design to comply? Um, and these are questions that if I were to do a model for every single version, I would spend way too long, both from a budget perspective, but also not be able to answer the question effectively because I would have 10, 15 models at best that would show different configurations. Um, what you're seeing here is called a parallel coordinates um, graph. And what it does is it visually represents the outputs and the key characteristics of a large sample of models. Um, this sample, uh, by the way, was created using uh, Energy Compass, uh, the Energy Compass tool. I was, um, I was part or I worked with, with uh, some of my colleagues from RWDI who developed this in, in um, in collaboration with TAF and with uh, Sustainability SCADA. And it's a great tool because it allows us to do exactly that. It allows us to sort by building typology and really play with the different characteristics. And if you bring this in front of a client and say, what are your must-haves and what are the things that you're flexible on? 
And if one of the big ones is around window to wall ratio. So what you can start seeing here, is you can start filtering based on targets that you're trying to achieve based on specific, let's call them non-negotiable characteristics. And then really get a sense of the flexibility you have inside. Um, we're not designing a building here. We're providing targets for the design team to develop. Um, and visual tools like this really help narrow down that, uh, that exploration. Another very common question, and this one I get more internally because I, I work side by side with architects is, what massing option will give me the lowest energy uh, use? Um, and at this stage, we know very little of the building. We just literally know the shape. Um, and getting a comparative analysis based on the general characteristics is really important. Um, and, and what's really key here is that we're really trying to match the detail of our analysis to detail the question we're being asked. And nobody's expecting uh, the exact energy use intensity for this massing options. They're, we're all really trying to figure out is what the, the relative change would be. Um, so not focusing on the specifics of chiller performance, fan powers, what lighting power densities we're using, really just putting a set of assumptions that are consistent across all buildings that are typical for this building typology and just looking at magnitudes and understanding which forms lead to less energy is, is, really, is really key. Energy modeling is evolving. Um, energy modeling from a tools and software perspective continue to change um, and being able to keep up with that change in software is really a key requirement of an energy model. Uh, there's lots of online resources to teach. There's a great community that's, that's willing to, to help out. And really, we need to thrive for a continual um, improvement. We can't be stuck in, I can only use this one tool. And that's why changing the framework from energy modeling to consulting really allows us to use the right tool for the right um, job. Building design is also evolving. Um, I say things like, BRF systems, to little core heat recovery, electrochromic glazing. We're not really part of the design conversation a decade ago. But as we continue getting more stringent in our targets and we continue to understand better the building, um, we, we start seeing all these elements. So continuing to keep up just like with the software, but on the building technology side is really what keeps us as energy consultants relevant. Um, and the last, and to be honest, I should have put this at the beginning because Buildings, and we have to remember, buildings are for people. We design buildings, but we design buildings to fit a specific need for an occupant. And those keep changing and keep evolving. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, has put a lot of emphasis on, on indoor air quality, uh, flexible ventilation systems. Um, I'm working remotely or flexibly in, our, in, in, my, in my role now and, and designing for flexible kind of uh, work schedules and, and building use uh, means that we really have to shift our, our approach um, to design and model to suit and to best serve people. Um, and when we ignore this or we take people for granted, what you see on the right is what happens. Um, um, occupants are really clever at finding ways around what we provide them. And if, if you don't fulfill the needs, if you don't understand, um, what the intent of what people want, then you'll have um, these disruptions in the way that design was intended. So in this case, when they were designing the pathway, uh, they made an extra step and people are very efficient at finding the shortest distance. And as a result, you have all this grass now turned into, uh, into a path. So always remember what we do is for people and the focus of what we should be doing is to make people um, better. And the last one, but perhaps kind of one of them, I'd say the most important one or the one that I'm, I'm hoping you can take away from this and, and, and really continue growing on this is high performance uh, and energy modeling is part of high performance, really requires us to, to approach things with a different mindset um, in order to be successful and make meaningful contributions to the process. We really need to be open-minded. Um, we really need to come in to workshops or to presentations or to design uh, meetings um, with an open mind. Um, kind of be humble and be willing to be proven wrong. There's nothing wrong with being wrong. Um, what's, <laughs> there's something wrong with not wanting to be wrong and forcing your thoughts because 
that's how you've been doing things. Um, and, and always look to learn and continue learning from peers, from other uh, disciplines, from other, um, from other consultants, but also within your own industry and continue to keep, keep updating. Um, there are no dumb questions. And that's oftentimes the biggest challenge uh, or the biggest hindrance to high performing design is that really breaking away from rules of thumb or the same as usual is needed. Um, global events, and we talked about kind of pandemic, we looked at where the climate change is taking us, um, the growing field of internet of things, <laughs> occupants being more engaged. This all really um, shows us that the way we've been designing buildings for the last 20, 30 years is not the way we're gonna address today or future needs. So challenge and norm, ask your questions and make your voice heard um, because you, me, and occupants, we're really, we are the ones who know what we need and what we want um, now. Design or high-performance design needs to be multidisciplinary. It needs to be integrated, it needs to be iterative, uh, but more importantly, it needs to be accessible. And energy modeling can be if we don't treat energy modeling as an accessible tool and accessible language, we fall into those old habits of turning everything into a silo. And really we wanna be able to speak energy modeling or speak energy across, across all, all, all disciplines. Um, but luckily we're all in this together um, and there's a grow, great growing community of like-minded people that share these thoughts and these beliefs around high performance. Um, so find them, connect with them, continue growing your network, continue growing your community. So Sustainable Buildings Canada, Ibipsa Canada, LinkedIn, these are all great opportunities to continue engaging and um, yeah, continue building on this community and become an, an, active, an active member um, of it. So reach out, I'm always here. I'm always happy to, to go out for, for a coffee, or just talk about pretty much anything. Um, but if it's more specific around career, I'm always happy to do that. Um, and I guess we'll open it now for, for any questions or thoughts that anyone may have. That was fantastic, Sebastian. Thank you so much. Students, go wild. Turn on your cameras. Somebody has to have some thoughts on things. Oh, my. <laughs> Amkar, just open up your camera and speak. It's a informal and lovely. Hey, Sebastian, thank you so much for that session. It really was nice. And uh, thank you for opening up so much. We it was really glad learning about your experiences. Uh, one, one thing which I would like to know was uh, our current project, which you are going to work on, is uh, already an existing building and it's going yes. to be built in something new, right? So how can we best tie uh, the energy modeling with what we are going to expect? or what should be the expectations for the person who will be assigning the role for? That's, that's a great question. And, and oftentimes when we talk about energy modeling, it is in the context of new construction. Um, from an impact perspective, existing buildings are the way to go and we should leverage other buildings because they're already there. Um, there's ways to model um, existing buildings. We, we have the advantage with an existing building is that we know how the building is running, we know that a lot of people that are in there. We have utility bills. Um, it's it's hard to put a specific target to kind of the energy performance, but what we can do is we know where we are now, so we can always thrive to do percentage better. And we can really, rather than create a model to do that, we can look at other performing arts centers, looking at what their energy use is, identifying, I think this is the key, is identifying who we want to be like. And what are some of those high performance spaces where we see them and from an energy perspective, uh, but also from a, from a just occupant perspective, like what are some of the spaces you walk into and say, I enjoy this space. 
And then we can take it back and look at the energy use. We can take back and look at the design considerations. Um, but really um, just looking at like finding great examples or finding places to benchmark ourselves is great. Um, from a design perspective, um, there's this idea of performance driven design where we give or design teams are given kind of free range on what they can and can't do um, with the requirement that they either achieve a specific performance or they thrive for a specific target. Um, we, we shouldn't lock ourselves into, you have to be 25% better. You have to be 30% better than you are now, but we should have those goals at the beginning and say, this is our poll, this is our benchmark, let's aim for it. Throughout the process, we'll find that it might be reasonable, we might be able to get more or less, but it's a continuous conversation. Uh, and uh, just to confirm hmm. what we said, we, we need to assess the data which is uh, existing over there, right? In order to make that comparison. Yes, so it starts with, the, so for an existing building, it starts with where is the building at um, from an energy perspective. It starts looking at other similar buildings, at least in the typology or the, the, the kind of planning that we're aiming to do and looking at those comparisons and, and driving that or, or bridging that gap. This is for exist, the existing side. There's also gonna be a new section. And, and yeah. when we combine those two for a new construction, it's easier to set targets. Um, we're bound by things like Toronto Green Standard, by Ontario Building Code. So I think on the new construction side, it will be somewhat easier to set up a target because you can look at passive house. Um, but there's also for existing buildings, there are certifications that drive better performance. So lead for existing buildings, um, there's, um, there's a well standard, there's all sorts of great sources, not necessarily to go through the certification, but to draw um, examples for. So looking at where, where the current building is, where is it from an energy performance perspective? Does the space suit the needs of the occupants? Do we have other building type, other buildings in Toronto? in North America in similar climates. And that I think would be my, my, my limitation is make sure that it's on the same climate. Um, and then let's, let's look at what they did, what they did right, and bring it into our, our, um, our design. I'm, I'm big on benchmarking. Um, I'm benchmarking to buildings that actually built and actually run and operate. I think the flaw of benchmarking to targets or, or to design is that when I look at like, models when you compare what the performance is at the design stage and what the building actually uses it's a 30 40 percent gap um, and that's been a, a, an area that we've tried to address but it comes from the fact that we are making a lot of assumptions at the science stage um, we don't have to make those assumptions in accessibility we have that information there so let's leverage what is already there what we know has worked Thank you. Then there's a question. There's a question in the chat. Thank you, Sebastian. By comparing the results of the IES versus VE Energy Plus and Design Builder for a project, do you think that they're relatively similar? Yes. So, in order for these tools to be kind of, let's say, allowed to be used for things like certifications or building codes, they have to go through a calibration kind of standard that's ASHRAE standard 100. Um, that basically looks to make sure that we are equal inputs lead to equal outputs. Um, all the engines are different and they have their small tweaks, but fundamentally they produce the same results given the same, um, the same input. So that, that's a really important uh, part of understanding kind of where we're starting from. Um, they do provide similar results, but if we go back to what I said about models being always wrong, they provide all model, like they're all relatively similar, but always kind of approximate. So treating tools as approximate values and, and not really holding to, oh, this said 201.5 kilowatt hours per square meter. Like if we focus on the specifics of the numbers, we lose the potential to really leverage the knowledge that we're getting from, from these models, from how the building, how the energy is being split across the different uses. That's something that's really important, how different design 
options are stacking to each other from a comparative perspective. And it's always order of magnitude. Um, but, but yes, all these tools will lead to similar results. It comes down to preference. Um, I've been using IES for a very long time. I know how to use the tool. I'm familiar with the environment. And each tool has um, specific benefits to using it over the other one. It's just finding what works uh, for, for you. So IES for us works. I can look at Energy Plus. I can use Energy Plus, not as efficiently. Um, and as a consultant who kind of has to document its time by the hour, looking at efficiencies is also kind of another aspect of, of what we do. And recognizing again that, uh, oh, I just wanna make sure, yeah, we're still on. Uh, so Melina is just asking, obviously they're using a lot of eQuest. Uh, thank you for your great presentation and time. Could you please tell us between learning E plus and eQuest, which one do you recommend? In research, we see E plus, but I want to know what is needed after we graduate. Great question. Um, and I would like, eQuest is a great tool and it's, it, I learned how to model through the use of a tool called E4, which is way back web. Um, then I moved into eQuest. Um, eQuest is a great learning tool because it's kind of limited in what you can and can't change. And it's a great place where you can start and build things, but build things that generally will work and play with small changes. With IES, with Energy Plus, they're open-ended. Uh, engine. So you can really put any number you want in anything and it'll run, but it'll give you very weird results. Um, I would suggest like things like Open Studio. So eQuest was funded by the Department of Energy in the US. All that funding and research has now moved to Open Studio. Um, Energy Plus is an engine. Um, Energy Plus needs what we call an interface to operate. So Design Builder is one interface. Um, but that one you have to pay for. Open Studio is free, and Open Studio would be the one that I think presents the most interesting opportunities in merging research and pra practitioners. One of the challenges with IES is it's not a tool that's generally used from a research community. So all this kind of more progressive, advanced modeling approaches are really hard to implement from this tool. So Open Studio would be the, the, the suggestion. Um, and there's great resources in terms of kind of documentation and, and, and just forums. And that's the thing, finding a, finding a group of people that have used it. You can learn, you can try to learn as much as you can from the tool and how it operates. It's really when you have a project that we're just put into a project that, that you really, um, for good or bad, learn and, and scratch your head. So I would say Open Studio. Amazing. We have another question. I'm hoping we, unfortunately, you're going to get cut off. <gasps> uh, how would the, I know, but we'll see you at the coffee break. I've sent you the yes. link and students, if you have additional questions, you know, anything, literally said so open hearted. It's wonderful. Um, how would the energy model of a building that generates energy differ from one that doesn't, from one that generates energy? That's an interesting question. That's an interesting question. Um, typically when we do models, it's for buildings that, I mean, most of them, all of them use energy, um, through PV or through some other, um, renewable energy, it, it uses it. Uh, I would say that building performance modeling is not, or I haven't used it for power plants or for elements that generate, um, energy. Um, but yeah, um. Maybe maybe we can talk about it on the on the coffee break and, and expand. Santa, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not sure what, <laughs> what kind of buildings we're talking about. I'm hoping that it's one that use renewable energy, in which case we just add it as part of kind of a, it's like banking your energy on an hourly basis. So you generate, and you're really looking at the difference between use and um, generation. Yeah, 